Yeah, so as a quick overview, uh, I'm going to talk about a new mutual information estimator, and then I'm going to talk about some particular advantages uh, of things you can do using this estimator. Uh, so I'm going to start by talking about it. So as a bit of background, I think the goal of sort of much more work-a-day neuroimaging analysis than we've heard about today, but sort of more old-fashioned, uh, is that the goal is to detect and quantify some modulation of your recorded signal by an experimental stimulus or condition in the help of that uh, builds up or helps you understand a little bit about the function. And to do that, we use tools from statistics. Uh, primarily uh, in our field, there's a focus on determining statistical significance uh, within the frequentist sort of null hypothesis testing framework. But I want to emphasize, I think there's increasing recognition that it's very important also to quantify in a meaningful way the size of the effect. So I think there are many advantages of the information theoretic framework, but if you just take uh, one away with you today, I really want to emphasize the fact that it gives you a very nice consistent effect size across a wide range of statistical comparisons. Whereas many of the conventional tests and statistics that we're familiar with, they have you know, effect sizes that are a little bit harder to compare. So just to set this up, sort of where and how strongly does the stimulus affect the recorded signal? Here's an example of that question. So this is EEG data recorded from a single sensor in an event-related design in a, uh, with a, a stimulus that is some kind of modulated image of a face uh, with a parametrically ver varying visibility of the left eye. And then uh, this is the ERP plotted for different values of that stimulus. Uh, so you can see that there's a very clear effect of the stimulus on the, on the recorded EEG signal, and we want to ask where and how strongly does it affect that. Well, we might say it certainly seems to affect it by eye between here and here, but sort of how strongly is a harder question. So the first thing we might do is a rank correlation between the recorded EEG voltage at each time point and the stimulus value across trials, and we get something that looks like this, which starts to answer the question, but I think doesn't completely because there's a zero point here. Does that mean the brain is not really responding, it's not significantly responding uh, to, the, to the, there's no significant modulation there, but it would sort of fall within the range where by eye you would say there was an effect. So I'm going to try and convince you the mutual information, uh, I'll show you how we build up to a result like this and try and convince you that this I think is a better answer to this question of where and how strongly uh, is the signal modulated. So what is mutual information? I think there are many different interpretations that can be applied to mutual information related to coding, uh, transmission, channel capacities, and stuff like this. It's a very elegant theory about communication. But I think the most useful from a neuroimaging perspective is the simplest, and to just view it as the effect size for a statistical test of dependence. So it really is uh, the effect size for a, for a test of dependence against the null hypothesis that two variables are independent. In fact, it's equivalent to the log likelihood test of independence, which by the neman pearson lemma is the most powerful uh, test uh, of dependence. So it's also quite a principled thing to do from, from a classic statistical point of view. But it's quite difficult to estimate in practice. So one, we just heard about symbolic uh, methods for time series, but uh, what I'm presenting today is an alternative method uh, which is actually gives an approximation of mutual information. Uh, it's semi-parametric that provides a rigorous lower bound, uh, which is useful for statistical testing. And of course, I want to emphasize there's code online, and there's a preprint which goes into much more detail that's currently under review. So what are the particular key properties or advantages, I think, of this estimator? They are particularly its multivariate performance, which I'm going to talk a little bit about. It's rank-based, so it's inherently robust and performs well on noisy neuroimaging data. Uh, crucially, we can combine continuous and discrete variables within the same framework, so it sort of unifies what would have been t-tests, chi-squared tests, and co correlations, all with a uh, common effect size. And in the preprint, we show it has equivalent statistical power to existing methods where they're available uh, you know, in these univariate cases. We do statistical inference with non-parametric permutation testing, and I want to emphasize uh, maybe it's, it's very easy to use. We're not talking about a toolbox or hundreds of parameters of the sort of uh, techniques we've been seeing today. It's just a plug-in function uh, that replaces correlation and calculates a bivariate function of two variables that gives you this effect size. So I wanted to say a little bit more about what I mean by multivariate here. Uh, I'm talking about what you might call intermediate multivariate, so sort of two to ten dimensions. I think we're very well served, obviously, by classical univariate statistics. And I think recently we've inherited a lot of techniques from supervised machine learning for very high dimensional spaces, like more than 100 dimensions. And uh, this method can't do hundreds of dimensions, but it can do something in the range of 2 to 20, depending on your data. And I wanted to try and suggest that that fills in uh, like a niche in the middle here, 
where you could still exploit the local properties of your signal in space and time, but at the same time get a bit of a boost in power over you know, having to do univariate reductions. Now I wanted to again emphasize it's really very simple. You just concatenate your, your multivariates, your multiple variables to, to do a multivariate calculation. And also I think it could actually be combined with the supervised ML to, uh, to give again a measure of performance that uh, gives again this common scale that allows you to compare many different situations and uh, do some of the other advantages that I'm going to mention if I have time. So some examples of these sort of low dimensional multivariate responses that I think are quite useful. Uh, we have obviously complex spectral data is two dimensional. And it's often interesting to split that into phase and power. In a multivariate setting, these circular variables become less of a problem because we can just keep the 2D representation. We have again MEG magnetic field vectors, which we might want to look at without reducing to a single maximum variance direction, direction and also look at their amplitude and orientation. I'm going to show today an example of adding in a single trial temporal derivative. Uh, with fMRI, we might want to have multiple uh, measures of activation within a single voxel, for example, the beta corresponding to the HRF as well as its derivatives. And we might want to consider multiple responses at the same time, for example, to get at representational interactions, uh, which I'm also going to hopefully tell you a little bit about. So this mutual information is a bivariate measure of dependence, but I'm going to try and uh, sort of hopefully convince you that it forms the basis of a framework for data analysis. And there are other uh, information threaded quantities that consider more than, more than two variables and let you answer additional questions. I mean, obviously, this is a bit of an overview, but I just wanted to make the point we have many different statistical tests which have obviously effect sizes that are hard to compare uh, because you have, first of all, inherently different statistics and also you know, very different degrees of freedom in different particular experiments. So all, all of these things are maybe hard to compare, but they all have a direct information theoretic sort of analog. And the crucial thing is that the information theoretic values, they really give you common quantitatively comparable effect sizes that you can meaningfully compare in a quantitative way, add and subtract and so on. Uh, conditional mutual information is like partial correlation. It lets you condition out the effects of other things. We have uh, direct information, which is like transfer entropy. We just heard about, we have a measure of communication, which is uh, I'm going to hopefully mention. And we have other measures like interaction information, which is uh, maybe conceptually a little bit similar to RSA in that it lets you quantify the similarity or representational interactions between signals. Most of the examples I'm going to show today are MEG and EEG, but I just wanted to show a very recent result that's not in the preprint, which is that we can also do it reasonably well on fMRI. So this is just a, a single subject visual oddball versus standard. Uh, this is a standard SPMF test output with a family-wise error of 5%. And this is the sort of single voxel mutual information calculated from single trial betas. So I, and, uh, uh, done with a permutation test, thresholded with a permutation test. So I think you can see we don't lose much. And I mean, obviously, there's not really much point in doing it if you're just going to look at this image. But with the information theoretic framework, we have the advantage that we can now look at the redundancy between these regions, between individual voxels. And, uh, and so on. Yeah, in fact, here are some of the advantages. So we can do computationally efficient, non-parametric single subject statistics. Uh, we can consider multivariate, uh, these multivariate betas, which I think could be more powerful than the F-test, uh, which tests uh, hypothesis that at least one of them is significant. But here we can really find you know, multivariate effects. Uh, we can directly evaluate and condition out effects of other trial by trial confounds. And we could look at these representational interactions, uh, which in information theory we call redundancy or synergy, either between regions, between individual voxels, or with alternative modalities such as simultaneously recorded EEG. Uh, so I'm going to tell a little bit about representational interactions. In many cases, you might have two sort of statistically significant uh, modulations in two different responses, whether they're different cortical regions, different temporal regions, different frequency bands, or as I just mentioned, different signals like EEG and fMRI. In all of these cases, you might ask, to what degree are they, is they, they similar, the modulations? If you observe one, uh, does observing the other one add any more information, or is it sort of overlapping, and in fact, you, you get everything from the first one? So returning to the original example with the, we saw up to the rank correlation, if I calculate now the mutual information at each time point just in the EG voltage, we get something that looks like the absolute value of the rank correlation, because mutual information is unsigned. So here we have exactly this case with two peaks an early peak and a later peak. So we might want to ask, 
you know, to what degree is the information here the same as the information here, or do you do, you do a better prediction if you looked at both of those time points? So we can answer this with this quantity called interaction information, which I'm going to skip the detail, but conceptually measures this overlap in the information between the two responses. And because of the nice property of uh, mutual information, this is just a linear uh, thing of combination of information values. And then there are three outcomes for this quantity. We have either redundancy, which means that there's an overlapping representation, and it suggests that the modulations uh, reflect uh, the same processing mechanisms. If it's zero, it means that they're somehow independent. And we can also get synergy, uh, which means that the actual trial-by-trial -trial relationship between the two responses is itself modulated by the, by the stimulus. And as far as I know, synergy, while uh, redundancy can also be addressed with RSA or, or cross-decoding methods, I think synergy is something that can't really be address addressed with those methods. So here's an example of this. Uh, I do this interaction information between every time point. This is a single subject, a single EEG sensor that I showed before and we do the interaction information between every time point with every other time point. So here negative values are redundancy, and you can see that this peak here is mostly redundant with itself, and also these two peaks are sort of redundant with each other. But I was very surprised when I saw this to see this very strong synergy, and I wanted to point out that this synergy actually corresponds to a region of the time course where there's no information in the voltage. So I really didn't expect to see this, and I tried to think about it. What does that mean? Uh, it means that the actual EEG voltage value doesn't tell you any information about the signal, but when you know two neighboring values, wherever they are sort of in absolute value, that tells you something. So I think the simplest relationship between two points is the difference between them, and then that's the single trial gradient. So I tried that out, I thought it would be too noisy, but in fact if you do the statistics on the, the single trial temporal derivative, uh, you get a very strong uh, modulation, which for me was revealed by the synergy. So if you did have to do one-dimensional statistics, in fact in this experiment, you would be better off doing it on the single trial gradient, which is something I haven't seen people do a lot in EEG and I thought was interesting. But within this mutual information framework, we don't have to do one-dimensional statistics. It's all multivariate. So I can just throw both responses into a two-dimensional response. So at each time point, we consider the voltage and the instantaneous gradient of the voltage. And now we get this curve I showed you at the beginning, which I think answers this question of where and how strongly in a much clearer way than the conventional rank correlation. Because this really shows you, okay, it starts here, we have this profile where there's a little ledge of weaker stuff, then it becomes strong and then slowly tails off. And I think it would be hard to pick up that temporal profile from looking at this. And again, we can do even multivariate interactions between the two dimensional responses. And this shows, in fact, this ledge is somehow independent representation from the later part. So this is a work in progress, but hopefully it shows some of the applications. So even with a single channel sensor level EG, these methods can add something over a standard statistical analysis. And hopefully I'll convince you that there's something useful, the synergy, although these uh, concepts can be quite complicated, uh, you know, here it directly showed something useful to me, which was to look at the gradient. And all of this can be applied directly to EEG and MEG. And it's relatively quick and easy compared to many other, uh, you know, like computationally intensive techniques. Uh, connectivity and communication, I don't think I'm going to have very much time, but I'll just skip over in detail. Uh, the point is we use this idea of redundancy from the interaction information and combine it with the Wiener-Granger causal framework. So to make this same step from just looking at differences in activation to looking at the, informa the information value you know, modulation by a specific stimulus, we do that in this Wiener-Granger causal framework to say that it's now no longer just a, a, a relationship between the activity in two areas, it's really about the information content in the two areas. Uh, so the basic argument is this. if uh, one region shows information about a stimulus at an earlier time, T1, and, for example, a left electrode, and then another region, for example, electrode on the opposite hemisphere, shows information at a later time. And crucially, if this information is really the same, so the representations here just in this one-dimensional space are the same or two-dimensional, uh, then this suggests that they're communicated from A to B. And we have a quantity called directed feature information, which is like an extension of transfer entropy uh, you know, that, that incorporates this, this idea. So that instead of thinking about just the activity, we're thinking about the second level thing, actually the representation or the information content in the signals. So it actually measures the redundancy about F uh, between the past of one signal and the present of the other signal, sort of conditioning out the past. So sorry, I just uh, didn't have time uh, to go into that too much detail. But the main thing I want to get across is that we have a practical statistical framework for neuroimaging data analysis based on information theory. 
Uh, it's a simple statistical function. It's a plug-in replacement for correlation, but crucially can handle multiple different statistical comparisons, including the sort of intermediate multivariate, continuous and discrete variables. And in all of these, it gives you effect sizes on a meaningful, I mean, actually additive common scale. So I think having a consistent effect size is particularly important for large-scale automated results repositories and for meta-analysis, the sort we've heard about this morning. So my hope is that this framework or something like it, uh, where you have many different tests all with a common effect size, could actually really help with this problem if it was widely adopted, because uh, meta-analyses become much easier. I already find it quite useful in my work that you know, I really have an intuition now for this uh, effect size scale. And when I look at a new data set, I can easily tell if it's out by an order of magnitude because I'm just used to working with the values. So I think this thing of really being able to compare behavior, being able to compare uh, you know, all different responses in different experiments in different, uh, you can also look at the comparing the output of models or simulations all on this common scale. I show an EEG and a little bit of fMRI. We also use it with MEG. It can also be applied to LFPs or combined as I hope to try with uh, large scale multivariate decoding. I'd like to thank my collaborators, primarily in Glasgow, but also Stefano Panzeri, who developed the DFI measure. And just to reiterate that there's code online and a preprint that explains it all probably much better than I have today. And it's really just very simple function, so very easy to try uh, compared to, to probably many other things. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Robin. Elegant presentation, really. Um, yeah, I, I was uh, just uh, uh, wondering about the effect size. Uh, I like, I love this idea. Yeah. I think uh, the effect size, are, you know, we should absolutely be reporting those and address the power aspects. Uh, so I was wondering a bit of the power aspect and can relate to the coins D uh, easily. And especially, I mean, how does that effect size measure uh, evolve the amount of data? I mean, is, is, is there a dependency, which I don't uh, yeah, there's sort of a weak dependency. So I mean, you know, one has to, in the information theoretic world, we call it bias, and you have to be careful about having this, this bias. Yeah. But this, um, I didn't go into too much detail, but this new estimator has very, very low bias, uh, at least sampling bias. Okay. So effectively, as long as you have a, a reasonable amount of data, it's not, it's not really a problem. I think that's really the advantage of this estimator that lets you then compare across uh, different sample sizes, for example. Right. Uh, was, yeah. was and then comparing to D prime, I'm not not so sure we want to do some sort of more grounded sort of power analysis and work on that. But I mean, they do have a real, you know, one bit means a reduction of uncertainty of a factor two. So I mean, there, there is some intuition that you know you can build up. So. And the, the other question, partially already addressed, is the uh, the amount of data that you need to start, especially in the multivariate case. Yeah. I would say it depends how strong your effect is. Sure. <laughs> so that's, that's so. We've kind of, kind of thinking that it would prevent uh, like a group analysis, for instance. Uh, but, you know, I think that we are yeah, I, I mean, I have some other ideas about group analysis. So I would always do this sort of at the single subject level and then yeah. combine yeah. the information. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, nice. yeah, I would say that uh, you can, I mean, it's not magic. It's not any really better than any of the individual tests, like a t-test or a Hotelling's t-squared test. So if you have enough data to get a result with that, you will get a result with this. The example is that the advantage is then, you know, that you can compare it more easily across multiple multiple cases. Um, quick question uh, myself. myself. Yeah. Uh, Robin, is there any qualitative difference between the application of this method to fMRI data versus EEG or MEG? I'm thinking particularly of the HRF. Yeah, I mean, I, I do it on the GLM. I mean, I do single trial betas from the GLM in the same way uh, many people do for multi for, for multi for multi voxel. Point, nothing, it's all the same. Uh, well, no, I mean, you first have to do this sort of non-information theoretic analysis step where you extract the activations with a general linear model. But then once you're working on your activations, it's the same. Okay. Except you don't have a time course, you just have one per trial. Yeah. Question right at the back, thank you. Uh, I have two questions really. One is, um, can you tell us a little bit about why this is more computationally efficient than just doing mutual information? Uh, because it's, um, it relies on this sort of semi-parametric assumption that it only quantifies uh, Gaussian copula dependence. So you can have any marginal distributions, but it'll only quantify the dependence based on the assumption of a Gaussian copula. So that means it gives you a lower bound on the real information, but it means it scales much better to multiple dimensions because you have the advantage of the sort of Gaussian properties. So it gives you a lower bound, not the true value. So 
Of course, there are advantages to doing the much more computationally intensive techniques, but I think what I've found is that in many realistic experiments, you know, it's sensitive enough and uh, like this, this advantages it gives are worth the trade-off that you're not actually measuring true nonlinear mutual information. Uh, so when you calculate this uh, copula-based um, um, uh, mutual information, how not related to the uh, other typical use of the Poisson window-based uh, estimation when you have the continuum variable? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's just a, you, I think it's just a different method. So I mean, I think by Poisson in your window, you mean a, a kernel density method? Yeah. Then I guess you will have to choose some sort of like a parameters that are there. Okay. Um, when you actually have general continuum variable. I think this question is especially important because you emphasize that um, you could actually use this uh, Gaussian combination <coughs> to um, calculate the mission mission for both uh, discrete and continuum variable at the same time, right? So uh, the ranking yeah. actually matters, so the actual parameter matters. Yeah, so I guess I don't, I don't fully understand the question, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a lower bound, so it doesn't give you exactly the same as the, the KDE uh, methods. I think it, within neuroscience, the most common alternative methods are these nearest neighbor methods, which have their own problems with uh, low bias but very high variance. So I think it's a trade-off compared to those methods. You know, it, it doesn't measure every nonlinear effect. You measure only the Gaussian copula dependence, but it's so much better behaved and you know, still gives you a consistent effect size within that. Uh, so. I see. so basically, when you rank that, so basically you rank the lower bounds. <coughs> Sorry, I don't. When you rank different mutual mutual value, you calculate in this way, you actually rank the lower bounds. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know. I, I, ranking the lower bounds. Uh, yeah, uh, the lower bounds of what? I don't really understand. Yeah, because you mentioned that you know the commoner can actually only measure the lower bounds. Yes, so yeah, yeah. I'm yeah, wondering if you actually can only rank the lower bounds, but that's not very strange. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by rank, uh, but maybe we can discuss it afterwards. So. Yeah, I have to take it offline, yeah. Nico. Um, can you comment on the relationship to the distance correlation, which is also an interesting mutual information estimator that has some good properties? Does it scale? <coughs> is, is it better behaved for this lower dimensional regime where you actually have Gaussian copulas? Would it be more powerful than using distance correlation? Well, I think uh, the distance correlation is certainly better in high dimensions because this Ultimately, you rescale, you normalize your data, and then you estimate a covariance matrix. So you, obviously, there's a limit to it with your data of how big a covariance matrix you can estimate. So I think in high dimensional cases, distance correlation is, is you know, much preferable. And also, distance correlation really captures this nonlinear stuff without this assumption of just capturing ga co Gaussian copula dependence. Um, I'd like to try and think some more about the real you know, relationship between them. Uh, one thing we have looked at is doing pairwise mutual information between many different stimuli and sort of trying to think about that as similar to the distance correlation and so on, but we don't really have any, any concrete thoughts. But I think with the distance correlation, it's the key advantage as I tried to get across here, one of them is being able to do this interaction information. And I didn't talk about it today, but you know, there are uh, extensions of this with a partial information decomposition that let you do this to really get a, a sort of different information contact in different low dimensional variables. I think that's useful. I think that's something you can do with the distance correlation. But yeah, I mean, it's uh, the right tool for the problem, I think. OK, I Thanks. think we've had a stimulating discussion here. But we still have one more event to, to do. So I'd like to thank uh, Robin for a fantastic Thank talk. you.